Good to see you, and uh, it's wonderful to have you with us, and uh, super exciting day today. Uh, we have a chance for uh, King's Christian College to get on the podium a little bit later on, so uh, really looking forward to that, and if you're here visiting, if you're uh, friends of Elijah or his family, we want to welcome you, and thank you for joining us today, and uh, we're super looking forward to that uh, afterwards. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm taking a little bit of a departure, actually, from uh, from the series that we've been doing. So I've been doing a series called Song of Ascents, but uh, decided to change it up a little bit today to keep in line a little bit uh, with the Olympics and being a champion. So with that in mind, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. And it says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Another translation says this, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. I want to talk to you today about the diet of champions. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask and pray that you help us to be the wise, discerning, disciplined followers of you that you've called us to be. I thank you and praise you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, 21 years ago, I uh, moved to Queensland. I uh, originally grew up in Victoria. Uh, and so, um, you know, like every other second person on the Gold Coast. And, um, I, um, uh, and one of the cultural differences I didn't understand about Queensland was that they celebrate the closing off end of year season and Christmas season for two months. So basically, uh, the breakups and the breakup parties for different businesses and that sort of thing actually start in November. I was very not used to that. I grew up in Victoria. Uh, we actually go to school leading up right up to Christmas Day uh, and that sort of thing. So I wasn't used to students not actually going to school in December. Uh, I wasn't used to breakups and parties all happening from November. So my first year on in Queensland, uh, I um, remember, you know, the breakup season starts in November. You go on all the breakup parties, that sort of thing, November, December. Uh, and then I remember I weighed myself after Christmas and I'd put on three kilos. I couldn't believe it. So I remember the next year came around and I thought to myself, right, I'm not going to fall for it this time. Um, I'm going to make sure that I don't have make the same mistake. So I put in a very strict exercise regime. Uh, I was doing a lot of fitness, a lot of exercise, exercising daily to make sure that I didn't put on that same amount of weight. And then at the end of the Christmas season, weighed myself again and put on another three kilos. <laughs> And I thought, how did I do that? You know, I did all the exercise. I did all the fitness. How was it that I put on an extra three kilos? And then I realised, yes, I was exercising, but I still ate like a pig. So the entire time I'm eating all the cheesecakes, eating all the cakes and that sort of thing. And so by the end of it, no matter, no matter the fact that I did all that exercise, at the end I still put on some weight because who knows if you want to get fit, it's not just exercise. It's also diet. Uh, if you want to be a champion, it's not just about the exercise. It's also about the diet. My cousin Ashley is married to former world pole vault champion Emma George. Uh, and so they live in Perth. Uh, and so about 20 years ago, I was staying at their place. At the time, Emma held the world record for the pole vault. Uh, and so she was right in the midst of a whole lot of heavy training. And so I looked inside their fridge. Uh, and when I looked in the fridge, uh, there was some food with labels on it. Uh, there was food labelled Emma's and other food labelled Ash. All the junk food was labelled Ash. All the health food was labelled Emma. We had breakfast there. Ash made breakfast for me and him. He didn't make breakfast for Emma. She didn't let him. And he made for me uh, and him, you know, bacon, eggs, carbs, hash brown, sauce, that sort of thing. Emma, for breakfast, she had this one little poached egg uh, and a little English muffin. Uh, and so she was eating a lot healthier than us. Uh, we were eating all the junk food, but that's because she was elite. That's because she's a champion. That's because she was training to be the best she could be. Because who knows that if you want to be fit, it's not just about exercise, it's also about diet. Uh, many years ago when Queensland used to win the state of origin, there was a player by the name of Travis Norton and I heard an interview with him and, and Travis was interviewed and he'd been, it was a back roll for the Maroons and had gone through a great burst of form and was playing very well. I heard the interview with him. 
they said to him, what was it? Why have you improved so much? And he said, well, I haven't done much different really. All I've done is adjusted my diet. And because I've adjusted my diet, the results have shown. Because who knows that if you want to be a champion, who knows if you want to be fit, it's not just about exercise, it's also about diet. Did you know it's the same if you want to be a wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ? Did you know it's the same if you want to be a champion for the kingdom of God? It's not just the exercise. It's not just the habits. It's not just the church attendance. It's not just that. It's also about, it's not just exercise. It's also about diet. Diet is what you consume. Diet is what you let on the inside of us. That's why it says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. Be careful what you let on the inside. We need to guard what we consume. We need to guard our diet in order for us to be everything that God has called us to be. And so the title of my message today is called Diet of Champions. And I want to talk to you about the three avenues or the three areas we need to be guarded in to make sure we're not consuming the wrong things. And so uh, when it comes to natural diet, obviously you just got to guard what you eat. But actually when it comes to spiritually, there are three avenues that can we need to guard and be careful, three doorways into our heart that we need to guard and have a very strict diet. The first area that we need to guard is we actually need to guard our sight. Matthew 6, 22 to 23 says this. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So watch this. He's saying what you see comes on the inside of you. If you see light, then light comes in. If you see dark, then dark comes in. The first thing we need to guard is our sight. We need to be careful what we look at. We need to be careful what we allow ourselves to dwell on and to put our focus upon because what we focus on eventually comes on the inside of us. The thing about what we see is that what we see creates desire. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Very often, God will allow us to see things and it gives us a desire, gives us a goal. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, actually, that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you get dreams and visions. When God spoke to Abraham to try and impart him the faith he needed to be the father of the faith he became, he said to him, look to the stars of the sky, so your descendants shall be. He also said to him, look at the sand of the seashore, so your descendants shall be. So he put before him a vision. He put before him something to attain because it births desire on the inside. So in many ways, that can be overwhelmingly positive. We're hoping today that as we watch the swimming later on, we're hoping that and hoping that Elijah has a good performance and that might inspire others when they see it. Young people around the nation say, that's what I want to do with my life. It puts desire on the inside of them. And so that can be positive, but who knows that can also be negative. That if you see and dwell on the wrong thing, it could create a desire and an appetite on the inside of us that is not helpful to our future, that can cause us to do things we wouldn't otherwise do because a desire has been created. I mean, this is essentially what happened in the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says in Genesis 3 verse 6, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he, and he ate. So watch this. The one tree they're not allowed to eat from, it looked good. It was desirous. Highly unlikely that as soon as God told Adam and Eve not to eat from it, that she went and just ate it. But she kept looking. She meditated. She was window shopping. Until eventually just kept going past it. I'm not supposed to be looking at that. Looks good to eat though. Surely it's okay. And eventually after Satan tempted her, she grabbed it and she ate. She would not have eaten it if she wasn't looking. What we look at, without getting too graphic, who knows that a lot of problems in society are things that we've been allowed to look at are things that people have allowed themselves to look at, created desires that are not helpful. And because of that, it's caused them to go astray. We do a thing at church called encounter retreats. We do it for people who've done compass, and we do it for people who are on a team and haven't done one yet. Really, it's somewhat of an acid bath. 
to try and deal with things that people have been exposed to beforehand. When this generation right now has been exposed to too many things too soon. And because of that, it's created an appetite which is not helpful. We need to make sure that part of we live through this sin-sick world. One of the things, if we're going to be the disciplined followers, champions that God has for us, we need to be careful at the things we look at. It also depends on perspective as well. Perspective. You can be in the same room with the same group of people. You can leave happy or sad depending on what you're looking at. It's amazing how we can focus on things that are not important, focus on things that upset us, and then all of a sudden that gets on the inside of us. Or you can be in the same environment and focus on the positive. That's why as believers, we need to make sure that even in things like that, wherever we are, we focus on the positive, not always on the negative. We should be known by what we're for, not by what we're against all the time. And in the same same way, we should do that when it comes to our perspective. We need to guard our eyes. The second thing, that we need to guard, or the second way that we diet and consume is through sound, through sound. Acts chapter 2, 1 and 2 says this, when the day of Pentecost came, all of them were together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the roaring of a mighty windstorm came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. It's talking about the day of Pentecost, it's talking about the believers being in the upper room, and they said the sound of a mighty rushing wind came in. It doesn't say a mighty rushing wind came in. It doesn't say that all of a sudden a cyclone came in, the wind, the you know, ceiling got blown off and they're all on the sides like this hanging on. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say a mighty rushing wind came in. It says the sound of a mighty rushing wind came in. What does that mean? It means spirit travels on sound. Ezekiel 37 prophesied to the dry bones of Ezekiel. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 37 verse 7 that Ezekiel prophesied as I was commanded As I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. The bones came near a bone to its bone. Spoke, sound, then things started moving. What did Jesus say we should do with mountains? He said, speak to the mountain, and then it'll be moved. What happens when they took, the Israelites took the city of Jericho? They shouted, and then the walls came tumbling down. Spirit travels on sound, which is why we need to be careful who we listen to. Because you pick up the spirit of a person by the sound. The most, the most interesting thing about that is this as well. Someone can say the right things, but have the wrong spirit. Bible tells us in the book of Acts that um, the Apostle Paul went to Ephesus, and as he did, there was a young girl with a spirit of divination, it says, walking behind him, walking behind him and said, Here these men are the servants of the Most High God. And she's saying the right thing. But it's annoying him. If you do a study on it, it says spirit of divination, spirit of python, it talks about control. She was trying to get attention on herself by actually flattering him. But that's another story altogether. And so she just goes and she's saying, here are the servants of the Most High God, till eventually he had had enough. And he cast the spirit out of her and she stopped. Notice this. She was saying the right thing, but had the wrong spirit. That's always the most deceiving thing sometimes in the body of Christ. People can say the right thing, but you know, there's just something bit off. You can tell it's just the wrong spirit. What do we need to do? Guard our ears. Bible tells us in Psalms, the very first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, it actually tells us, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who's careful who he listens to. Because who we listen to, it determines our values and it determines our thoughts. And if you can control people's thoughts, then you can control them. Let me teach you how to create a cult. It's very easily, very easy. Two ways. Number one, you love bomb people. So what that means is you find people who are from broken homes, you find people who are a bit disenchanted and you love bomb them. You just, you know, love on them and you just like try and control them. And and so people think, wow, these people really love me. That's the first step. Uh, in creating a cult. The second thing you do in creating a cult is cut off all their external influences. Because what you do is you get them and then all of a sudden, now I've seen a few uh, documentaries on cults, I find it very interesting. But, um, <laughs> and, um, and you see, and what happens is this, the cult leader just spends days and days indoctrinating the people and then cuts off all external sources. Why are they doing that? You only listen to me. I'm the only person you listen to. And eventually you start transforming their thinking. And if you start transforming their thinking, then you can control them. In the same way, we need to be careful who we give 
ear to. Even at a time and season that we're in right now, we need to be pretty careful about making bold statements based on people that maybe don't have the best information. We need to be careful about who we are upholding as someone who's an authority in particular areas of life right now. Because the Bible tells us that even if they might be saying kind of the right thing, they may not be carrying the right spirit. In the same way, we need to be careful right now who we need to listen to. You know, one of the things I prayed for at the 8.30 service is that people in our church would have a spirit of discerning, would have the gift of discerning of spirits. Um, The Bible tells us about there's nine gifts of the spirit. I don't like the phrase gifts of the spirit. I prefer manifestations of the spirit. When it talks about gift of the spirit, it's kind of like, okay, I've got that gift. I can operate in it at any time I want. But actually, that's not an appropriate translation of that. It's more manifestation of the spirit, which means I can operate in these different gifts at different times. It might be what Pastor Bill's going to talk about uh, in King's Collective and that sort of thing. And of the nine gifts of the spirit, if you read them, I know myself at some point I've operated in all of them, but it's not like I can have them at any time. However, one of the gifts of the Spirit is discerning of spirits. Discernment. And the Bible says we can desire spiritual gifts. And so my prayer is this, that every single one of us will be able to have a level of discernment, that we're careful who we listen to, that we're careful that just because someone's cousin saw something doesn't mean it's actually the truth, that we need to be people who have discernment and have wisdom and can navigate top troubled times like we're in right now. We need to be careful who we listen to. And the third thing is this. So the first thing is we need to guard our sight. Second thing is that we actually need to guard sound. And the third thing is this, we need to guard our speech, our speech. It's interesting, you know, it's like, well, speech, you know, why does that work? Well, Proverbs 18, 21 says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, those who love it will eat its fruit. What does that mean? It means we eat what we say. What we speak, we actually feed on. So we need to be careful how we talk because how we talk, we're actually going to feed on what we say. Now, there's a twofold side to this. One, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So no doubt, if you've got things going on in your heart that can manifest in the way that we talk, totally understand that. But it's actually more than that. We can actually determine uh, how we feel, our attitude, our demeanor, what we feed on by what we actually say. The Bible tells us in James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire uh, by hell. Notice this. He says, our tongue corrupts the whole body. What does that mean? What we say, we feed on. Think about it. If you speak negativity, doubt, and unbelief, how do you feel? Well, you don't feel better. Try it. Oh, that's useless. That's stupid. That's hopeless. That's terrible. You don't feel any better. But if you speak words of life, I know one preacher used to drive, when he was depressed, he used to drive around in his car speaking excellent words. Wonderful. Tremendous. Fantastic. Great. Started feeling better. We feed on what? We say our tongue is so powerful. What happens on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, where God wants us to have a fire on the inside? What does he give us? He gives us a new language. We get to pray in tongues. And then as we pray in tongues, we get filled with that boldness and that fire. It's that tongue. It's that mouth. It's the way that we talk. That's why the Bible says the same tongue shouldn't have cursing and blessing coming out of the same mouth. Don't be praying in tongues for an hour and then bad mouth everyone else. Amen. I know that's not our church. I get that. That's other places. I just visited a church in Cairns. They were terrible, but us, we're unreal, right? (laughs) How we talk, and one of the great disciplines of the Christian life is to not always give full vent to what you're thinking. The Bible says a fool is one who gives full vent to everything they're thinking. Have you ever been really stirred up about something, really fired up about something, and wanted to say something and didn't, and then six hours later, you're glad that you didn't say what you were going to say. That's one of the great disciplines of the Christian life, being able to guard our mouth, keep it speaking positive, 
Keep it sweet. As Christians, we must be the hope, most hopeful people on the planet. You might be saying, how can I speak positive with all this going on around me, with all this chaos? Well, do what God did in Genesis chapter 1. When he saw chaos, he didn't say, oh, there's chaos. He didn't do that. He looked at chaos, but he didn't declare chaos. He looked at chaos and he declared light. Let there be light. And there was light. That's our model for living. We don't get dragged down into the way the world operates. We're different. We're an embassy. We can be like God. The way that we speak and we talk can change the world that we're in. We're not just forever giving a commentary of what's happening in the world. That's weak Christianity. But as Christians, we don't just give a commentary on it. We speak life to it. We speak new direction. We speak victory. The art of being a champion is discipline, which means doing things you don't feel like doing and not doing things you feel like doing. And it's the same with our diet. That when I'm looking at something and I'm tempted to look, have the discipline to turn. When someone pulls me off into the corner with a juicy bit of gossip, very tasty to the ears, and when I feel like spewing forth stuff that I know I'm going to regret later on, Think about the three wise monkeys. And if you do that, coupled with the exercises of the Christian life, you'll be the victorious overcomer and champion he's called you to be. Last night, I was watching the heats of the 400 metres. Heat number five, King's Christian College boy on there. Sitting back, eating the cheesecake my wife made (laughs) with a dollop of mocha ice cream on top. What a champion. (laughs) It'd be nice to be like that one day. I have a feeling that that boy has not touched any of that stuff. We talk about that physically. It's the same spiritually. Victorious, overcoming, elite champion Christians that he's called us to be. Watch our eyes, watch our ears, and watch our mouth. Amen? Too right, mate. And so I want to pray for you. And I want to pray, I really feel very strongly right now, if I can be so bold and honest with you. I'm concerned that some of our church is too easily led astray by misinformation. And I want us all to have a spirit of discernment, have a level of wisdom not here preaching or politicking in any way, but I just believe we should be a people of wisdom and discernment. The righteous are as bold as a lion. We don't rush to things. We work, walk purposely and we walk carefully and slowly to navigate these dangerous times. And my prayer is this, that every single one of us will have the spirit of the gift of discerning of spirits that is available for all of us. Amen? And so if you're saying, Ben, I would love that gift, you know the Bible says you can desire it. I don't have that gift where you can have it just got to desire it. So if you want to desire, I want to pray for you right where you are. So with every eye open and every head up, if that's you, just stand to your feet, I want to pray for you. We're a church family here and just stand, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God will give you the gift of discernment, discerning of spirits, that you will be able to ascertain. It's interesting, the Bible tells us in 1 John that he says to him, you have learnt right from wrong. You know, you have an anointing from the Holy One. I'm going to pray that you have an anointing from the Holy One to have discernment and wisdom. The Bible tells us we can ask Him for wisdom. He'll give it to us freely and liberally. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank You for Your church. I thank You for Your people. And I just ask and pray, Lord, right now that every single person, we ask you, Lord, you give us discernment and wisdom in these times, Lord God, as we follow you through the treacherous waters that is happening across the planet, we pray for your discernment, your wisdom and understanding. Lord, I thank you. We have an anointing from the Holy One and we ask and pray for that, Lord, to be upon every person. I thank you and I praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God one more time before we close.